What's up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of the Celtics Talk podcast here on the NBC Sports Boston Podcast Network. So the Celtics, the roller coaster ride continues. Coming off a loss last night against Philadelphia, very winnable game. Celtics up seven with about four and a half minutes to go, and everything came unglued. So there is consternation yet again in Celtics land as we try to plot the path forward. So to try to help us roadmap that, call that my buddy Bobby Marks from ESPN, front office insider, uh, try to dive into what Brad Stevens and that Boston front office group is thinking here six weeks before the trade deadline. Uh, and trying to just roadmap a path forward that, you know, maximizes the current core of the team, but also gets the help that this team so clearly desperately needs to get off this roller coaster. But no easy answers here. Uh, I will say one of the more positives uh, to pluck from that game is that Peyton Pritchard has started to play better. Uh, we've seen moments from Aaron Neesmith, you know. Anyone who's been listening to this podcast knows that uh, I'm on Team Young Guy uh, because you need to figure out what you've got and you need to figure out um, just what they can do and what they can be. And if nothing else, to increase their trade value. So uh, one of the things I'm, I'm eager to get into with Bobby is, you know, what does the Celtics do with with the with this current makeup? Is it better, as you've heard me say, to, to maybe swallow hard and move on from from Dennis Schroeder and maybe Josh Richardson if there's a market for him? Uh, maybe open up playing time for those young shooters and see what they can do with this core all while, you know, trying to figure out what pieces fit and, and how you're going to navigate and what becomes of Al Horford. It's partially guaranteed deal next year. So a lot on the table. Uh, and frankly, it's just uh, because of the state of the Celtics 15 and 16 back under 500. Now um, got to, got to figure out uh, what's ahead. And do you kind of cling to the hope of, of getting healthy? We've, now seen a couple of games here with Jalen Brown and it's looked really good at times. Uh, but you know, it's two and a half seasons of, of 500 ball. And I do think there's a bridge coming where the Celtics got to decide, you know, what is the path forward? And uh, not a lot of easy answers for Brad Stevens up on NBC sports, Boston.com uh, to try to ignore all the COVID craziness in the world dove into Brad's first 200 days in office, looking back at about 18 moves that he's made since uh, taking over for Danny Ainge. Um, you know, I think there's more hits than misses in there. Uh, he certainly uh, hit a home run with that first deal. But as you hear, we're gonna, I'm going to get into Bobby with uh, about that. You know, there's there's a draft pick involved in that in that Kemba for Horford deal, and so uh, you know, some questions remain about whether uh, whether they they that he made all the right decisions here moving forward. I think the one gripe I have is that. Roster is a little thin on shooting. Maybe it was banking on the young guys being being bigger parts of this, but uh, the additions of Schroeder and Richardson probably clogged the path there. So, um, you know, as we see, like Garrison Matthews lighted up with Houston. Uh, there's some decisions there. Was Jabari Parker the right guy to hold on to at the end of the roster? And it's, certainly that's been highlighted now as the Celtics try to navigate this, this these COVID deficiencies and a uh, thin roster. But Let's dive right in. Let's get into uh, my interview with Bobby Marks and, and what's ahead for these Boston Celtics. All right, here with Bobby Marks, ESPN front office insider, who's kind enough to join us from Las Vegas. And, and Bobby, I want to start there. Uh, what's it like? Like the, it, we, we keep talking about all these depleted NBA teams, but it feels like the G League squads are getting getting raided by the minute. You know, it's funny. I landed here on Sunday uh, around 1030 and Usually there would be players coming to Las Vegas. There are actually players <laughs> leaving Las Vegas. I saw Justin Anderson, who I believe mm -hmm. got a, um, a 10 day. I saw former Celtic uh, Taco Fall, yes. who was on his way back to Cleveland. And I, it's funny. I was talking with the guys from Cleveland and they were saying like, we felt so bad because I think Taco was like in the, you know, and you don't, you're not flying him first class out here. <laughs> so basically he flew out. And then you had to put him back on a, on a plane mm. back to uh, back to Cleveland. So it's, it's different. I mean, this is, we're in the COVID era. This is not the showcase like two years ago where there was, you know, eight teams had eight or 10 executives. I think there's only five GMs out mm. here, but at the end of the day, it is a good showcase for players like Mario Chalmers. Um, we've got this G league ignite team. That's got mm -hmm. a lot of scouts salivating <laughs> as far as for next year for this, I guess, 2022 draft. So 
it's just a different environment just because you don't know what whose roster is going to lose players based on 10 day hardship uh, exceptions here. And um, and it's cold, man. This is not your <laughs> Vegas. This is not your Las Vegas summer league here. This is I just went out to, for a walk and it was like 40 degrees. So um, it's a lot different than 105 in uh, in early July. Well, it's funny. I had the scouting report on the uh, on the weather because my neighbors just got back from their honeymoon in Vegas and they said the same thing that we had a day up here in New England that was 60 and they were mocking us because uh, it was warmer than when where they were out there. I will say this, too, about Taco Fall. It's a good time to get a call up the Celtics and Cavaliers if everything goes off are scheduled to play on Wednesday night. And uh, Celtics have to worry about the Taco Fall revenge game all of a sudden, <laughs> uh, especially with their depleted front court. Before we jump into the Celtics, and yeah. it, actually, and I'll tie this in too. You said G League Ignite, CJ Miles, who was there for like a, probably a cup of coffee and now back with the Celtics to uh, to try and weather this storm. I want to talk about Danny Ainge landing in Utah. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, you've been through this and you've yeah. stepped away. Like, are you surprised? Cause like, I always knew Danny had the itch, but I'm just curious from people that, you know, have, have dealt on the inside. What are you surprised he dived back into it so quickly? I, I'm not, I think what happens usually Chris is that the, the more you're away from it, the less that you want to get back in it. Mm. And I think because the window was still somewhat small when Danny left Boston, um, what was it about six months ago, yeah, not probably barely. six, seven months ago that you still have that, that craving, um, I think it's, it's good to hit a l- little bit of a reboot, refresh yourself and figure out what's there. I don't, if it wasn't Utah, I don't know if it would have meant made mm-hmm. sense for him somewhere else, but because of his ties, you know, certainly playing at BYU and, you know, having a relationship with their owner and them having an, o- an opening after, um, Dennis, uh, you know, Lindsay stepped yep. aside and, you know, certainly Justin Sanic's done a nice job, but, um, I think it just kind of made sense from from all sides so not totally surprised because i do think six months of not worrying about running a basketball team does wonders for you as far Mm -hmm. as you know kind of refreshes you well and that transitions perfectly too because danny said and one of the you know one of the things that actually got people up here a little i wouldn't say steamed but like you know scratching their heads is danny said he needed a break from boston now you look at the roster and he they had a starting five the other night that was all danny ainge draftees jason tatum jalen brown robert williams grant williams was in there you know uh there's his fingerprints are all over this thing but uh clearly the celtics are stuck in a little bit of, of a rut from just watching them from afar bobby like what what's your take on why they just can't get themselves on track and and sort of the status of the team. Well, I just think there's the, the continuity factor. I think it's just such a rotating door of who's in, who's available. Um, you know, either, you know, Jalen had missed that extended period of time. Now he comes back, Robert Williams is out, um, you know, for personal reasons. We've got COVID issues. I mean, J- poor Josh Richardson. I mean, goodness mm-hmm. gracious. I mean, um, how many more times can he go into health and safety <laughs> protocols here? And you've never really had, you know, kind of a, a 20 game sample of keeping this roster intact. Then you throw in a rookie coach, right? Like you're kind of like mixing and matching. And I always said, like, the goal is just to stay around 500, right? Just keep Mm -hmm. your head above water. Hopefully you either you're going to get your group back or you're going to make a trade and you can go potentially go on some type of run, but it's like that for a lot of teams. Like, unless you're Phoenix, Golden State, um, probably the jazz, we can put them up a little mm. bit there. I mean, it's basically like where every team is in like survival mode right now, as far as, um, so talking to one GM saying, like I said, what's the, what's the one call that you're dreading, um, you know, at night. And he said, you know, three guys going into health and safety <laughs> protocol, because then you're diving into your hardship exception list. And it's, a, it's a little bit of a watered down, you know, as far as getting those guys here, getting them in, integrated. I mean, you're going to see that with, you know, a couple of guys that, that Boston has signed. And it's, yeah. it's just so hard to evaluate what you have. And I think a lot of, and now the, the next phase is like, people were saying, well, like, why haven't we seen any trades? You know, we're December, mm-hmm. everyone made a big deal about December 15th and the restrictions lifted and stuff. And um, teams are worried about just putting an eight man roster out there. <laughs> you know, they're not worried about going out and att- obtaining a Dennis Schroeder in a trade or, you know, seeing kind of what's available. I think that will come when we get maybe post Jan one, we yep. settle down a little bit. Um, hopefully this, this virus doesn't keep on kicking people's butts. Um, and then when you get closer to deadline, you kind of have a little bit more of an idea of kind of what you have, but yeah, I mean, I think for Boston, it's, I just think there's so many, there's so many different factors when, you, as I said, a rookie head coach, yep. 
different lineups he's had to shuffle Jalen being out hurt. I mean, you know, I mean, when you have your, you know, first or second best player um, out for an ex- extended period of time, I mean, that, that now you're asking for the younger players to step up, right? Like that's kind of been the whole thing. We've, I mean, we've talked about it for the last couple of years. It's wow. like the former draft picks, right? Whether Grant Williams or Langford or Naismith or, you know, that group, uh, Peyton Pritchard, who, you know, mm-hmm. you know, finally started to play a little bit more, but like who had two out of, you know, you need like two out of those four, mm-hmm. you know, three out of four in a perfect world to really develop into a main role. And some nights they are, and some nights they're not. Yeah. And it, it's funny. I just listen to you detail. I try to tell myself when I get overly frustrated with this team, because I mean, this isn't just a, a, a 30 game sample of them being 500. This is pretty much two and a half seasons of them just trying to get on track, but they've also been two and a half seasons of roster fluctuation, starting with Kemba and then going to, you know, all the COVID issues last year, you got Al Horford who missed the start of the season because of COVID. And now less than two months later is back in protocol, this new variant messing with everyone. He may kind of hinting the other night that, that maybe that's a factor. You got Josh Richardson who gets stuck in Phoenix, can't travel home because he, he tests positive. It's a false. He ends up coming back, has his best game of the season. And then the very next day he lands in protocols. Like it, it's truly, it's truly remarkable. So I try to keep that in mind, but the thing to me, Bobby, and, and I, you know, you've been in those rooms. Like, what's it like? So you're, you're the Celtics are 15 and 15 or, you know, actually 15 and 16 after last night's loss to, to the seven Sixers and they've got to make choices. Yeah. And, you know, it, how hard is it for a team when they have those variables to either lean in one way or the other, to be like, you know, we need to sell because this isn't this, that we're not the contender we thought we are, but you know, you're always clinging to this hope that maybe you will be, if you give it enough time, like, how do you balance that all? It's hard, especially because you have two players that are high level, right? I mean, when you have a guy like um, like Tatum, who's, you know, all NBA like, and certainly Jalen coming off an all-star appearance, it's like you want to hang on as long as you can, as far as thinking, you know what? Hey, we go eight and two over the next 10. Like we're right up there with the Chicago and Brooklyn and some of those, you know, other teams. But on the other end, we go 500 or we go below 500 now we're like last year. Now we're a playing team just trying to get in and that's hard. You know, the sellers part of it. um, I think there's more, um, there's more buyers out there right now um, because everyone is so where the standings are. Um, They're certainly out West. You look at teams like Sacramento who are, should maybe be sellers, but are are trying to get into the playoffs. And we don't know what's going on in Portland with, um, you know, as far as an interim GM and, it's really hard as far as from a front office standpoint. And then you throw in, we talked the variable of COVID with the roster shakeup, looking at your roster and saying like, all right, what one piece are we away from getting up there to the top three? What do we have to sacrifice? We've got all our draft picks. Um, So I don't know if I, I see one move where like all of a sudden, like, wow, man, like this team is like, you know, on paper, it looks like it could be a top three team. I think you're going to see probably like singles and doubles. You know, we've mm-hmm. talked about Schroeder just because it's like salary cap, you know, um, quagmire where you have a player making $5.9 million. Let's face it. He should be making more, yeah. um, has played well. You can only pay him $7 million next year because of his non bird rights. The likelihood is he's not going to come back on a, on a one year, $7 million. So what do you do with him? If you're at the deadline, and you're the six seed, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's that's a hard question for that front office to, to ask. I don't think you just trade him and get a future two, but is there maybe a guy that you have that has some years left on his contract? Mm-hmm. But the, the other problem is that team inheriting Dennis inherit, inherits the same problem that Boston just <laughs> right. had. So it's just kind of like, you know, things like, you know, those are the things that you're talking about. Certainly. I'm sure Marcus will be talked about once his restrictions lifted in, um, I think it's mid January. -January, Yeah. yeah. And then certainly Richardson, because, um, you know, he's got some length on uh, with that one year extension, those, you know, Hey, that's $30 million in, you know, Mm -hmm. salary that could go out, but um, that's, you know, I would always takes, but it takes two to tango, you know, Mm -hmm. like we could throw trade scenarios internally all you want, but you can call around and say, Nope, we're not doing that. Nope. We're not doing that. And um, that's, that's the hard part of it. And hovering above it all is the Celtics are just a little bit over the tax line. Yeah. If you're not a contender, you're going to want to shimmy down there. Especially they're, this year. Right. This year, when the you payout are, is going to be. Yeah. 13 million, man. Like that's, I don't care how much your owner's worth. Like mm-hmm. that's, 
that's still $13 million that you're getting back in league distribution money, where normally it's three to $4 million. I mean, it's, it's a monster number and you know, nobody, you know, you could justify if you're Golden State and if you're Brooklyn, um, you know, certainly Utah, those teams that are, um, you know, in the top of each division or each conference. But when you're kind of a playing six seed, it's hard to um, it's hard. It's, it's just hard to, to yeah. justify not getting that distribution money back. And, and I, I think you've summed it up perfectly. That's just like there's so many variables the Celtics are worried about. And, you know, I thought last year would be sort of the test kitchen that. All right. You know, you play the young guys, figure out who's part of this core. But there was an urge to go for it then. And I think every season that you have Jalen and Jason on your roster, there's going to be an urge. And so, like, I think it's going to be really tough for for Brad Stevens to figure out what the what the, the best play is here. But if my fear is there another just like you said, another playing tournament, you know, first, second round exit, you're still the 16th pick in the draft. You know, the, the roadmap to how you get that third star is a little bit murkier in that instance, where if, if you had a lottery pick to dangle, maybe it's it's a little bit more attractive. So but before we go forward, I want to go back. We yeah. did this first 200 days of, of Brad Stevens in office and uh, gauging his approval rating. Uh, I think <laughs> Brad has had, you know, he's made essentially 18 moves over the first six months. I won't bore everybody with them, but I want to focus in on a couple, you know, reflecting now on, on Kemba for Horford on the surface, Slam dunk because of the fact that, I mean, Kemba fades from the rotation. Horford, obviously, is a starter level player here, but they did have to give up a first round pick. And when you look at Sagoon down in, in Houston, it's like a piece that might have been valuable moving forward. How do you evaluate the, you know, that's the, the first big move Brad made uh, now six months out. How does, how do you feel that one is playing out for him? Yeah, I don't know about slam dunk just because of, you know, if we have the crystal ball and what Sangoon has turned into, yeah. but at the end of the day, would Boston have picked him? That we don't mm. we don't know that. Um, I understood the logic behind it though, right? I mean, as far as based on where Kemba was and where he is right now, and I know he played well against the Celtics in that return game in New York when mm-hmm. they played New York. But let's face it, he went from you know a um, a thirty four million dollar player to an eight million dollar player that we all raved about was one of the best signings of the off season to a guy that rel- was relegated to the bench, yeah. and I think. Certainly the injuries have taken a little bit of a toll on him over the years. And um, so I understood, you know, and I thought Al, I think Al's been good for Boston, yeah. you know, when he's, when he's been there. So I understand the swap, you know, certainly with Horford's year, uh, I believe next year is, you know, partially guaranteed, partially guaranteed. I think it's $14 million, somewhere in that range. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's a, it was a good trade. I'm not saying like it was a wower um, mm-hmm. just because, you know, we don't know what that draft pick maybe would have turned into, but to sell, you have to buy. And it's, you know, it's part of it as far as, you know, that deal doesn't happen without attaching that draft pick. Yeah. Do, do you think there's any market for Al Horford moving forward? It's a, you know, 26 and a half million, I yeah. think or 27 and a half million this year. You know, is there a contender? We saw golden state come through and I was trying to pitch myself. I was like, could Boston call them as like one more veteran piece to, to, to put them over the top or, you know, do you think, or do you think that's more likely that they have to wait to the summer to, to sort of evaluate what's next? I think, yeah, I think that's more of a summer thing. I think it's, it's hard um, just because and I, every player is tradable definitely in this league. I think mean, people have proved that. Um, but with Al at, you know, 26, $27 million to get back a $22 million player, you know, like who is that out there that's not happy or that team wants to um, who wants to get, um, to get rid of. And I think, you know, just circling back with, you know, waiting for that, you said waiting for that third star. It's like, we went through a phase where there were so many dis- unhappy pl- all stars, mm-hmm. right? Like we are not in that right now. <laughs> We've kind of like shift to a different cycle, whether it had been, whether it had been Harden or Anthony Davis mm-hmm. or Kawhi. I mean, the list goes on and on, but we don't know what's going to happen in Washington with Bradley yeah. Beal, right? We don't know what's going to happen in Portland with Damian Lillard here. We think something might happen, but until now, you know, everybody's just kind of in that, in that holding pattern. So how do you find that third star? Hopefully you can draft one mm-hmm. and, you know, but as you said, you're drafting 15 or 16, rarely do those third stars you find. And if they do, you're waiting two more years down the road. 
And then all of a sudden you're at the end of Jalen Con- Brown's contract. Yeah. And, you know, there's no guarantees moving forward. I keep saying that to people is that, you know, they keep saying, well, you know, maybe you go get instead of, uh, you know, trade for a 23 year old. Well, what if the 23 year old's not ready, you know, right. in, in, in a year or two, all of a sudden you're, you're, you're in that, you got to find the right sweet spot for that person. The other big move that Brad made, or, you know, big decision that he made that people up here are constantly rolling around in their heads is extending Marcus smart Yeah, from, a, you know, so I made the pitch when they made, when they decided to do it, that, you know, Marcus as a trade asset on an expiring deal is probably less value than one that has been extended. You know, I don't know if they know what the future holds. I think they've seen quality returns, but certainly the jury is still out. If Marcus is the point guard of the future for this team, um, does he have more trade value moving forward now because he's got the security? Do teams look at that and say, all right, we're trading for something that isn't just going to have to cross that bridge during the summer. Yeah. I mean, I think he's got value just because of, you know, you, what you're getting him and you already know what the number is. So yeah. you're not going into, I know. And the people are uh, the, the, devil's advocate will be out and be like, well, wait a minute, there's no team. There would have been no teams with cap space, right. Or a few teams with cap space that would have been able to go out and, and sign them. And we've seen certainly other ways for teams to acquire players as far as in a in trade and um, you know, where his number is. It's, I, it's, it, we, I do me and when Brian Winhorse, whenever we talk about this, Brian always says like when a player gets tra- uh, signed, the one question you ask is, is that player tradable mm-hmm. down the road, right? Like at, you know, what, 18, $19 million in, in that number. So I do think it's tradable. I don't think it's a dead weight contract because I think he still puts, gives you value. And I think certainly where his contract falls among, um, you know, point guards in this league, it's probably on the, in the bottom, you know, in that 15 to 30 well, range, right? you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the average, the average point guard salary is 25 million. So <sighs> when you look at it, yeah, I think he is more, um, you know, I think he's more tradable. On the other end, there has been situations where guys on expiring contracts have somewhat value um, if that team thinks they can resign him. But the other thing is that teams are not willing to give up as much for an expiring. They're not going to give up multiple first round picks or good players here because they don't want to, you know, they don't want to take that risk. So let me, uh, so as we start to spin it forward, let me, let me give you the roadmap that I'm, I'm that I think the Celtics should take. And, and let me know if you, th- as you try to, if, 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 you know, as we play, you know, fictional GM, armchair GM, how to, like how you would put this thing together. I do think Schroeder gets moved. I don't know what they get. I've started to think maybe it's better for them to target. Um, like you said, almost a guy that either has multiple years or at least has rights that yeah. they can consider moving into the future. When they made that swap with, um, Sacramento and Atlanta, I was actually mad that they didn't get DeLon Wright because I thought that was someone that would have fit what they needed more long term instead of Chris Dunn. But, um, you know, I, I start looking around the league and say, could they send Schroeder to Dallas and get back Trey Burke or somebody that's like, you know, might that the, the team is willing to move on from, but also has long term uh, value. Um, I think Richardson will be a consideration because two way wings are always valuable. Um so if the Celtics move those, maybe it opens more time for Neesmith and 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 Peyton Pritchard. Uh, you get to develop your young core. You're still not waving the white flag necessarily. Maybe you add shooting, which you're you're sort of desperate for at this point, you know. And then maybe make bigger decisions down the road, as you said. Maybe waiting for that disgruntled star. You know, is that a, is you know is is that a, a feasible roadmap in terms of it's not going to excite anybody. But at least you maintain flexibility. You sort of you sort of see what happens from there. And maybe maybe someone gets mad. Maybe Bradley Beal signals by February that it's it's time to move on. I mean, you hate to cross your fingers as a GM, but is there any other path for this team? No, I mean, because eventually you need your former picks to play extended minutes yeah. because you got to know what you have. I mean, like maybe you have something good that you're not getting in in a 10 to 12 minute range, but you know, when they're playing 20 to 25 minutes, like, you know, this guy has hit that development phase. And I think with, 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 you know, with Schroeder, he's not part of the future. I mean, that's the realist, that's the economics of the NBA here where he was great for a short-term fix based on the situations. It was right for them to sign him to that one year, you know, to a one year deal. I think for him, it was right to come here because he's certainly played a lot and has kind of, been on the forefront but you know as a, you know are you trading him you know if you can get you know maybe i don't know if you can get a, a first because there's those are still value right. especially on a one-year guy but if you can get multiple twos or if you can get a player as you said that has another year left um you know on his contract and right, you're right with with josh as far as you know wings have value you know wing, and wings you know six six guys that are have another year left on his contract 
have um, have a lot of value in, in this league here. So I think that's kind of that's your path as far as those are your two, you know, your two guys. And you'll know, you know, we're still six weeks away, seven weeks away from the trade deadline. You'll know where you are. But even if Boston is, um, you know, hanging around five or six, I still think the right thing is probably to do do something mm-hmm. with Schroeder. Yeah, and I, I'm actually with you. I've, I've said there's a path where you're sort of buyers and sellers. You, you're selling off pieces that just don't fit the future, and you're still looking around for what's out there. So uh, I don't I don't envy the situation they're in, but like you said, there's still some time. My fear is Josh Richardson is playing really well right now. Just got his uh, three point percentage up over forty percent. You know, sell high. You know, if I'm the Celtics, I'm as, given his down years with Philly and Dallas, I'm maybe. Uh, eager for this COVID stuff to go away so that you can explore the trade market a little bit more. Dennis Schroeder obviously played really well while Jalen Brown was out. Bobby, if you were building this team, what is the one piece that you're, is there one position that you say like, this should be the focus? If you could, you know, if, if in an, in an uh, ideal world, a power forward was to come available, a point guard was to become available. What is the piece that they need around Jalen and Jason to take this to another level? I would say point guard. I mean, I think it's such a point guard driven league. You know, each, every team, the contending teams have a high level guard, right? I mean, it, let's just, let's just face it. When you kind of look down at the, at where teams are in the, in, in the standings here, um, I think that's kind of, that would be my primary focus here. I mean, certainly getting a four to compliment, you know, Robert Williams, um, you know, would be a nice, you know, um, you know, from a secondary standpoint, but um, you know, f- for me, it's, it's always, you know, you know, do you have playoff depth? You know, I think there's a difference between playoff depth and, and, um, and regular season depth and like playoff depth is kind of what they've been able to do in Cleveland, you know, like Cleveland's got, you know, with Rubio and Kevin Love, I know, although, it, you know, $50 million of mm-hmm. playoff depth and Jetty Osman guys like that, that can kind of, you know, three or four guys that can come off your bench and then become starters, you know, finding veterans to accept the role coming off your bench is hard. You know, I mean, it's, it's really hard in this league, but that's kind of like, that's how I look at it as far as how they, how you kind of, um, you know, build, you know, build that roster out. So give, uh, let's see. So let's, let's, let's start to run down here on this uh, of the available names that we sort of think are, are going to be out there. Let's, let's say uh, Portland decides to blow this thing up and are willing to trade Lillard and or McCall for the right deal. If Indiana leans into training Sabonis, do any of those guys sort of fit you know i've tried to talk myself i love sabonis yeah. but i don't know if he's the right fit next to rob if rob's your guy you know right. do you sacrifice rob and try to fill it and figure out about sabonis you know I, I i think everything is through the lens of what fits great with the jays and certainly like a, a passing big man is is ideal but um you know i haven't been able none of the names that have been out there and you know i love dame but dame at 31 like sure. that's a roll of the dice with your core so it'll cost you yeah, you know, I mean, he he might be going. You know, you you certainly will probably you know still have Jason, but it'll probably cost you Jalen Brown. Mm. You know, it'll cost you, um, you know, multiple you know multiple picks. It might cost you something else. So it's like, what is he walking into, right? So now you've got Tatum and Lillard on um, eighty million dollars in in uh, uh, in salary, and then it's like, man, hopefully that the, uh, everything else kind of comes into comes into place. And I think Sabonis will be expensive also just because he's got besides this year, another two years left. And then as you talked about fit, right? Mm-hmm. Like the fit and I've talked about it with, you know, with Philly, um, you know, if Simmons, whatever happens with in the yeah. Simmons situation, like how does he fit with them beat? Right. So it's like, you know, and then, you know, people say, well, like get him and then figure it out. And I think <laughs> when they got, they did that already with Horford and, and it didn't work out. Um, so yeah, the names out there are not, you know, there's no, wow. Hey, you know what? I'm ready to, I'm ready to kind of just push it in as far as giving up, you know, multiple ones and a, and a good player, you know, for that player. And I just, I don't see that, you know, certainly there'll be names, you know, McCollum, uh, Nurkic and, and, um, and Covington uh, on expirings uh, out in, uh, out in Portland. We'll see what happens in Sacramento with some of those players. Um, you know, Harrison Barnes will probably hear about, but it's another team that wants to make the, pl- the at least the play in they're different than, I think a little di- di- different than Boston where they haven't made a play since 2006, mm-hmm. you know, 15, 16 years. So there's um, you know, there's a, uh, there's a priority there. And then the other thing too, is hard is that, you know, there's a lot of teams that have draft picks out, 
right? Like, so you're not going to be able to trade, um, you know, not going to be able to trade ones. Yeah, it's 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 a tough spot. I don't you know. There's no you know. It's funny. Like the best available player that fits probably best with the score is Ben Simmons, but yeah. I don't know if he fits personality wise with yeah. with the Jays. Like I think the Jays need sort of that. And I keep saying it's sort of like that Kevin Garnett type that yeah. comes in and you know, hey, we need. I haven't won here yet. I need. Here's how we're going to do it and yeah. kind of shake them out of their little early career doldrums. But um, yeah, so the Celtics are are stuck in wait and see mode. Well, uh, enjoy the the whatever is left of the G League. I'm surprised you didn't ask me about the one move that you did like, and I know what that was, and that was probably my my favorite. Okay, well we can go there. Robert Williams, the signing of the off season, the signing of the off season, and the extension. And I know it was a uh, it was a as I call it a future buy, right? Mm -hmm. Based on what you have and where his contract is, and you know it was always about just kind of keeping him on the court and when he's healthy he will exceed his contract here. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny too. It's, it's, you know, he's got this poison pill restriction on here, right. but because the, the, uh, the extension is so low, like you can, let's say if they ever did want to put him in play, there's ways to manipulate the money to make it, mm -hmm. make it work there. But I think that was one of the, um, I thought that was one of the, um, out of the transactions that Brad has done as far as locking him up, um, you know, long-term at a, at a really good number. Well, I, I need you to bring you on when people are yelling at me because of his availability, <laughs> and uh, it's been a it's been a rough time to be the the president of the fan, of the Time Lord fan club because he's uh, missed a couple of games with injuries, yeah. obviously, which is the, the the big issue. And then last night, even uh, personal issues. I don't. It's not injury related. Um, so, but you know that happens. It's I a tough know. matchup to miss, especially when you have to lean on Ennis Freedom for forty minutes against yeah. Joel Embiid. That would be another name probably to keep an eye on. I know he's oh, not true. a minimum, you know, but hey, does a team need a backup big right when we get to uh, to the deadline? And I mean, even if you can get a a future two, you know, mm -hmm. out for him. Um, I think I would certainly look at, at you know, with, uh, with, well, Dennis. well, the Celtic, and as you mentioned, and so I, I, I will never acknowledge just that, that Rob's tr poison pill is somewhat tradable, but the Celtics do have all those exceptions too. Yes. So they can manipulate they money. That. And Well, and, yeah. Know. I mean, that's the big thing too, right? We, we didn't really talk about it, is they've got the Fournier trade exception, right? Mm -hmm. But taking someone in puts you deeper into the luxury tax and is ownership willing to do. And it's not kind of like a, you know, there's not a, um, a uh, sticker on an expiration sticker on there that once, you know, that can go into the summer right. because that was, that happened then. So you can kind of reevaluate again. You're not, I think you're in a little bit of a different spot now than you were a year ago when you did the Fournier trade. Right. right? And you're trying to like, you know, jumpstart this team here um, where I think you can kind of wait until um, wait until July to see what's what's out there. And they're going to, and they might need it. If they do make a splurge for a third star, they're yeah. going to be down to bare bones in terms yep. of like what they're able to feel. They're going to need some exceptions to, to try to make that work. But yeah, you're right. I, I, every time I try to talk myself into a player, I say, I just can't see them going into the, it's staying in the tax. And, yeah. you know, maybe you get off Wancho's money and, and it makes it easier. And if you move Wancho and uh, Schroeder and don't take back a bunch of salary, maybe there's a way to, to manipulate that. And look, they, they've used four second round picks to get, the now Evan Fournier trade exception based on sending two out for Gordon, then sending yeah. two out for Fournier. So you don't want to not get anything with it. Right. Um, but yeah, they've, they've, uh, they've got to maximize this. They've got a couple of those where they got a 9.8 for Kemba. Yeah. Um, the 5 million out there as well, like for, uh, for Tice, maybe, and, you know, and what, all these deals that they've, they've got to, they've got, they've got ways to maneuver, but yeah. it's, it's murky, Bobby. I don't, I don't know. Even I when know. I try to put on my GM hat, I, uh, I don't it's envy not, Brad Stevens. I tell you what, G being a GM, in 2021 is a lot different than being a GM in 2019, man. I don't, again, I don't envy these front office at all, as far as how much, how many other things you have to worry about with COVID and what you have to play with in your roster and um, limited practice time. I mean, there's so many different variables here and we're just kind of in a different world. Let's end on this. If Danny Ainge calls Brad Stevens, should Brad hang up the phone immediately? No, he shouldn't. <laughs> but he shouldn't talk. Uh, he shouldn't talk to the trade front with him. It should be just more of a social phone call. <laughs> I all, all I think about is uh, hey, you know, if he's him. calling about Donovan. Hey, oh, that, there. Hey, <laughs> hey, there. You know, there we go. <laughs> that that is the Celtics fans' daydream when they when Danny Ainge took that job. They said, "Ooh," but things would have to go really, really sour bad. In, yeah, in Utah. really bad. I, I think the more likely scenario is is Danny calls and says, "Hey, we need some defense here. What's it going to take to get Marcus Smart right onto the Utah Jazz roster?" Yeah. And then, you know, I mean, they do have a late first round pick. 
Yeah. There's some pathways to like, I'm not, I'm just throwing it out. I'm yeah. just saying like I, every time a GM goes somewhere else, we try to connect dots, sure. but um, you know, they, the Celtics have to figure out their point guard situation before they even yeah. uh, broach I that. Agree. But all right, Bobby Marks, enjoy that G League showcase. Thanks I appreciate me... it, man. Have a great holiday. Okay. Be right back at you. Bobby Marks, ESPN insider. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Chris. All right. Good stuff there from Bobby, who is honestly like the nicest guy on earth. Um, He's on, he's out on assignment doing real work and uh, takes time. He doesn't even have his folders. If you ever watch him on, on, on ESPN in the, in his office, he's got this stack of folders, one for every team in the NBA. It's how he, how he keeps tabs on, you know, available trades and contracts and all this, but razor sharp knows that knows all 30 teams inside now, but that's what you got to do to work in a front office. Uh, and then parlay that into being one of the best guys on TV. So, uh, I wish he had more answers for the Celtics, but uh, none of us do right now. So we'll uh, we'll wait and see. Cleveland on Wednesday, hopefully. Uh, bracing myself for the Taco Fall revenge game. Taco versus freedom. Maybe Robert Williams will be back. Fingers crossed. Uh, but until then, well, the, the, the roller coaster ride continues. I need everybody to go hit like, subscribe. You're going to want to be a part of this because regardless of how the season plays out, like we're going to have stuff to talk about especially if the things get crazy and this, this roster gets overhauled. I need everybody uh, uh, on our YouTube channel for, for the full run-up to the trade deadline and whatever comes after that. Uh, we'll catch you next time on the Celtics Talk Podcast.